We want to rule our country. A fly whisk, a walking stick, and a well-decorated African hat were some of his trademarks. The man of average height kept a bushy beard and tidily brushed his long, kinky hair backwards. Yet he was many things, a former carpenter, a one-time municipal water meter reader, and before that, a store clerk. This is part of the profile of Kamau Wamuigai, who later became Johnson Kamau, and more consequentially, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta. Brothers, I think I have spoken enough in this language. It is not my wish that I should be speaking to you in a foreign and for that matter in colonialistic language. <laughs> And you in there had very strong eyes. <laughs> and for the most part of a 14 year period, that is the sharp glare with which Jomo Kenyatta kept our nation's affairs on check as Kenya's founding father, first president, and leader of its first black dominated government. It was to a shaken, relatively young, independent nation that the news was announced on the morning of August 22, 1978, that Kenyatta's watchful gaze had dimmed forever. That particular day, early in the morning, I got a communication from Naku, in Mombasa that uh, Mze is no longer with us. I had uh, gone to the post office to check my early mail. Now, outside the post office where I had parked my car, somebody came and wrote a small cheat and put it on my wipers of the car and said in Kikuyu, the, which uh, it goes, the fig tree has, it has fallen in Mombasa. Mogumo is fig tree. To me, it was just a guesswork. Say Mogumo. Then I remembered the Mogumo in Kikuyu. When we talk about Mogumo falling in Mombasa, this must be something to do with the Jomo. The 21st of uh, August, 1978, I, I rang him because I wanted to see him. Then I was told he's meeting with the ambassadors, but I told them to ask him to ring me when he comes. And sure enough, on the same day, at about 2.30, he rang me. And um, I told him I'll, uh, I wanted to see him the next day, uh, which was now the 22nd August, 78. And for the first time, we argued, or he argued with me, because he said, no, come now. He insisted, come. And then I, I, you know, I kept on explaining, I said, Look, let me come the next day, please. You know what he said to me? He said, shauli yako. And that was his last word to me. There was a total silence in many places. Nobody had told people to be silent or to keep quiet, but there was assumption all over, A, that it was not possible Kenyatta can die, or had, or had died for that matter. They thought it was a, a taboo to talk about the old man dying. So even if you told people that has happened, they, wouldn't like to, they didn't want to listen, and those who listened didn't want to respond. Kenyatta's death was our way out of, <laughs> into freedom, out of prison, into freedom. And you can't imagine how happy we felt when we got the news that he had died. <laughs>
The coastal city of Mombasa, Kenya's second largest city, was a favorite holiday destination for Jomo Kenyatta. Countless times he retreated to this city on what the official presidential press service often inaccurately referred to as a working holiday. On the morning that he passed on peacefully in his sleep in Mombasa, Simon Mwangi Wambogo was the police officer on duty at the communication operation room at the police headquarters in Nairobi. I got another call from Mombasa, either from Maheu or from Matu. And this one required me to dispatch one Air Force caribou. And that should be flown by none other but the Air Force commander, Colonel Gichuru then. Uh, we, are connect we were connected with Gichuru with the radio telephone to his house. So I also called him. And uh, the first thing he asked me, because Gichuru was once my boss, he asked me, what, you, what is your rank, by the way? I said, I'm an inspector. Since when did inspectors give orders to colonels? He said, sir, I'm not ordering you. I'm saying, I'm relaying a message from State House Mombasa. The caribou must fly to Mombasa, and you should be the pilot. At around 6.30, I got another call, this time from Maheu, no, from, uh, from Hinga. And he says, can you order all the provinces to lower the national flag and the police flag half mast. And I did that. For me, it's just to call every province. And when I call the PPU in each province, what he does down there, it was his business. So that was done. And then uh, I was beginning to receive calls now uh, from the state house. Karaidi was already there. And he says, cabinet meeting should be due any time. It should be there like now. And I want the cabinet here. Simeon Nyachai was at the time the provincial commissioner in charge of Central Province that includes Gatundu, the native home of the late president. The main purpose of giving me the message first was to ensure that uh, all the government uh, machinery in Central Province were given uh, that information very quietly uh, because the moment the news came out uh, through the media uh, a lot of people in central province will be asking questions what has happened and that kind of thing but the one person we hadn't found is the vice president daniel moy and when I became completely frustrated, it, it became necessary for me to talk to the province. They didn't know how to, how to reach him. I went down to the OCPD Baringo, and OCPD Baringo could not raise him. And we were not able to raise him even using the radio uh, system in his escort vehicles. When the OCPD went to physically look for him, at about 8.30, he was told that Moy had left with his convoy of uh, security detail heading outwards instead of coming to Nairobi. Because Mahu had informed me that he had talked to Moy himself and had informed him that the president has died. So when Ospiri really told me that, I told him, follow the way he followed until you catch up with him and make him come to Nairobi because it's the only reason why the cabinet meeting will not take place. I drove uh, to the vice president's house. Uh, that was uh, the honorable Daniel Arab Moy. Uh, he had uh, also arrived from uh, uh, Nakuru. I had a short discussion with him, uh, and uh, he was also waiting for various uh, formalities to be arranged. While I was there, uh, the the commandant of uh, the GSU came with, uh, I think, almost a platoon <laughs> of his people and put up the tents around the home of the vice president. 
uh, this is uh, just a security precaution that uh, once the news comes out, you don't know the reaction of various people. And uh, there was need now for the potential successor to be given adequate security. Despite failing health and his advanced age, estimated at beyond 90 years at the time, the death of Jomo Kenyatta caught many Kenyans by surprise, including some key members of his powerful inner circle. The previous day, I was to have two appointments in Nairobi. You see, now you, you, can, you can go. And then before I go, he was asking Mama again, who is, who is going to tell him to, to, to come and uh, conduct those dances and songs to attend for me. But my mom again I told him that you have given Koinange permission to, to go over there. So that's all right. I called doctor and asked him, are things all right? Oh, these things are perfect, all right. Uh, do you like to come and stay in the house? Oh, yes, it's all right. Everything is all right. Then, when we heard this shock, it was really unbearable shock. It is absolutely true that I personally feel the deepest grief in my heart. For valid reasons, curious glances were directed at Kenyatta's inner circle and subsequently the morning of Kenyatta's death went hand in hand with the anxiety of his impending succession. The last stages of Kenyatta's rule had been characterized by a vicious backroom jostling for political power, a scramble that sometimes spilled out into the open through various forms, the most prominent of all being the Change the Constitution movement fronted by leaders of the then powerful tribal alliance GEMA, the acronym for the Gikuyu, Embu and Meru Association. Njenga Karume was both GEMA chairman and member of the Change the Constitution movement. Mimi nipona hii kita niliona, niliona, niliona katiba vile inasema. Yaka tukazu kumuta tukiwa ulaya kwa jini vana kehika. Nikamwambia unajua katiba inasema nini, nikamwambia. Katiba, mimi nikona nikuwa naona. Sasa katiba ya nichi kama hii. Kuzimamiwa na mtu moja kama jenga karume ya umuingini. Hati, presidenti akifa. Au pengine awe mwojo hazi kufanya kazi, automatic, for 90 days, vice president is the acting president. Akiwa hata siyo mwoyo, akiwa ni mtu bayang, kabisa wa kuharibu nichi, siyata haribu. Dio tulikuwa tunasema, hii katiba tu change, tu amendi. Well, one of the things that I did first of all is to kill it by, by, by saying any threat, to the life of the president, or imagine that the president is sick or is going to die, that's treason. Uh, can you be a katiba? So na jua kuringana na 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 katiba according to the law. Uki uki imagine. Hata ku imagine. Give us a president. You are the treason. Na kwa pia si tu me imagine wapi. Can you be a? Me akai yo te wakati kenya tarikuwa na kubusa wugani amu kufikiri ya kutiaji katiba. Si sasa muna wana sasa na kuwa mbukoja niyo muna hata hiyo hiyo ni fikira zen diyo muta yada tulizo ni ya hiyo wana imagineze ni hiyo yen. Kwa hivyo, kwa hivyo hiyo mtuwe jojo alituchi, 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 unajua kenya taake kumai tutaki. But the rapid pace of events on August 22nd appeared to conspire against whatever other schemes. On the same day, Vice President 
Daniel Arap Moy, was sworn in as acting president and he immediately embarked on his first task, the state funeral of his predecessor, Jomo Kenyatta. My dear friends and fellow Wananchi, what fitting tribute can we pay the man who was a father to us all? How can we adequately express the grief that is deep in our hearts? The cruel ha hand of death has silenced a friend, a loving father, a gallant fighter, a great statement, this was Nzejo Mokinyata. May the Almighty God rest his soul in eternal peace. I do not think that Mze actually had uh, that idea that uh, he could have somebody in mind who would take over from him. I don't think that idea uh, was being nursed in his mind. He knew what the constitution said, that if anything happened to him, then the vice president would take over. And uh, Kenyatta was uh, very much behind the constitution. He never prayed with the constitution. And for that, I think he was satisfied with the boy position as a, as a vice president. Throughout the period, uh, Honorable Moi was the vice president. He demonstrated uh, very strong loyalty to Mze. And uh, he carried out what he expected Mze would want him to do. So he was uh, quite loyal and Mze trusted him. One may say anything about Moi, but I have never had Moi, even when he came to president for 24 years, I have never had Moi say anything bad against Kenyatta, even today. So he, that loyalty, I think more is mind is that Kenyatta is somewhere in Gatobi, and uh, he respects him as his boss. As it would later turn out, Moi's reverence for Jomo Kenyatta ran through all those who came into direct contact with the old man. Right from the time he emerged to take a place in the freedom struggle, Kenyatta was widely regarded with both fear and respect. He's literally a mythical figure, a larger than life, you know. Uh, he was this figure whom I always dreamt of meeting. When he called me to go to see him in State House, on an issue like uh, his passion on banking, when I got to State House gate, I would have water in my stomach. He has called me in a friendly way, but I'm worried about this man, what, what, he, may turn out, what he may tell me. And that water will not disappear until, until I have left the gate. No, you, Kenyatta was not a single person. He, he had that personality. He was a born, intelligent man. He did not require education. Uh, they, 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 they are those people who are born with that kind of intelligence. Some people like to call it even wisdom. Uh, probably we might combine the two. He had that. And that enabled him to work secretly in many things. His name was in the songs that were sung everywhere. Okay, you know, so you grew up hearing these songs, the military songs of the uh, mama, you know, uh, the question of education. So you knew that he was this person who had gone to England to go and get education and bring it back to the country. He was this figure who had gone to England to fight for our land. <laughs>
na mifugo yetu harambe as president for 14 years the image of Jomo Kenyatta was that of a towering yet relaxed figure a man totally in charge but fully at ease with the system he headed it is a style that was evidently popular among those who served under him including current president Mwai Kibaki Kenyatta's one time finance minister I have at many times remembered a time when soon after independence of this country those of us that were given responsibility in various departments by the founder of this nation, Ze Jomo Kenyatta, whom we all of us remember very fondly. It because when he gave you a job, you got a job. And there was no interference, and he would not keep ringing your juniors at night. And he would not, he would not doubt that you are doing what he gave you to do. Mze had what I would call in his own mind a system of command. A week would not go without Mze ringing me up at least twice in the evenings to find out how things are in the province. And I came to know that he was uh, doing the same with uh, my colleagues uh, in other provinces. He never liked the gossip. If you gossip uh, to, uh, against me, to Kenyatta, Kenyatta would call me and face you, say, what did you tell me about this man? And that way he would kill it. Uh, one day I was arrested near, Kodim, uh, near uh, 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 this what you call Koja Mosque. I was just walking the street as usual. So the 99 car stops. Say, Mr. Chikuku, sir, you are wanted state house by the president. But he didn't ring me, he said, but he asked us to look for you and take you there. So I got into the 99 car and so driven to state house. Kenyatta, who get out of the house, and I said, I'm going to go to the house, and I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house, and I'm going to go to the house, and I'm going to go to the house. They were having lunch, so I found Kenyatta at the head of the table. Next was Moy, next Moy, Charles Njonjo, next Charles Njonjo, G.K. Karivi, and then the bodyguard. But this seat on the left of the president was vacant. So when I came, he said, ah, banade kuku, karibu, karibu. The soup was brought, he took. Now, protocol never took place that day. It should have been after he has taken soup, it should go to Moy, then that way, then me. He took the thing like, Karibu, kunyo athubu, nabata nguvu. So I chotted mine, then the ball went the other side. Uh-huh, uh-huh, buwana the kuku. Akasungwa, he knew a bit of luya. Akasungwa means, what is the news? Sema Amalai. Oh, yes, that uh, is good news. Uh huh. What? Wabutere wana sema nini? Now, I didn't know why I was called. He was just engaging me in discussion. So, that time the fish had been brought, we were eating. Uh huh. What? Wabutere wana sema nini? And I came out innocently. I said, Wana sema, in Sirkali ya Kenyatta and Sirkali ya Hongo. Ati wanasema serikali ya Kenyatta ni serikali ya Hongo. Ndiyo mtuko fraizi. Kwa nini? Kwa sababu chief alikamato wakichukua soya. Ten shillings. Alikamato na superintendent wakakamega police. Red handed. It was police money which was treated. So, he handcuffed him. Took him to kakamega. After two weeks, he was returned. He was again a chief in the office. So what do I say? My is Rukali Akinyata. So we are coming to a Hongo. Then I na Rudi Kwendele na kazi is Rukali Akinyata. Is Rukali a Hongo. When Anjonjo uri patahi manena, Anjonjo said yes. Uri fanya nini? Anjonjo said we got the case, but uh, there was a technicality. We couldn't quite get a, a conviction. So Akinyata. Quite. I was becoming angry. I could see his face changing. Karithi, 
the fries kwenda uko habisi yangu pigia simu bwana boyt boyt was the pc ambia boyt kwamba ile shifu ya marama bwana vikuku anaitwa nani anaitwa jared otsora ile shifu ya marama jared otsora amefutwa kazi ready to go for his nap get them to go into the office from that time he had to finish his speech nyama ikaletwa na endelea he kept quiet he never talked again he was angry very angry after some time karidhi comes back he was a chief secretary eh eh bwana karidhi ulipata boyt ndio mtukufu rais ulimwambia nini ilimwambia umesema ile chief ya marama Jared Osora amefutwa kazi. Bwana Njonjo iko tekinikati tekinikali tingine. Njonjo never replied. <laughs> He asked, I'm asking you iko tekinikali tingine? Akasema hapana. Basi wewe bwana Dikuku. Huyu huyu Njonjo alikuwa ananiambia wewe unatembea kila mahali. Unasema serikali ya Kenya ni serikali ya hongo. Na mimi sikukuambia nimekuitia nini. Wewe uliniambia yale yaliyofanyika. Na huyu anasema habari ya technicality. Kama mambo kama hii lazima kuchukua hatua. I remember once when I was building Lillian Towers. I submitted the drawings to the Nairobi City Council for approval and they would not approve them then the reason was there was a, a 1954 bylaw which said because of uh, central police station you could not build anything beyond six floors now six floors for Indian towers it was not going to be economical i wanted to go to 16 floor but they would not hear of it they said no So I went to Kenyatta. And I, I explained to Kenyatta the problem. Then Kenyatta rang Goba. And he said, Goba, if somebody want to build a building to, to, to reach heaven, what is your problem? And then Goba, of course, has no answer. What is your problem? So he was told. Then Muzay asked me, what, what is it that you want from them? I said I want an approval. They have a stamp which they normally uh, stamp on the drawings. So Goba was told, let's meet in state house. I had met him in Gatodu. Let's meet in state house and you come with that approval stamp. He came. Approved the drawings. I got the drawings. Then Kenya turn around and say to Goba, you know what to do. And if you have a problem with anybody, I'm here. He made a remark which uh, sent my mind spinning i laughed but i didn't uh, uh, comment he said wewe ni muafrika na wewe ni kijana kijana wakati wanatengenezea wazee soup wao hapana onja sasa kama umekushafanya hii kasi yote ya kusaidia watu kuchukua mashamba wewe uwezi kuonja na kashamba <laughs> yeah. because i told him there is no way you can appoint the gay or excuse you from standing in parliament because the, there is the law i mean he says he is disqualified so he said i want this review if i can if i can uh, exempt somebody no if i if i can get somebody who is sentenced to death and a commute sentence to to life why can't i uh, uh, excuse him gay so we had to amend the constitution so that gay can stand as a member of parliament but kenyatta's way of doing things did not always attract approval his critics saw him in the same light as most of africa's post independence leaders who replaced colonialism with a new breed of dictatorship rested on a pile of broken pre-independence promises for me i had no doubt in my mind that what we had was a dictatorship 
and it is not what Uhuru was meant to be. The treatment of Mao Mao, for instance, after independence, was not really good. You see, we ignored the people who were in, in the forest and the mountains. Okay. We began to behave and act as if it's not they who fought in the mountains and sacrificed. We began to talk as if it is the educated uh, nationalist who somehow magically brought about you know, independence. Kenyatta used the same colonial laws that jailed him to jail John King without trial. I was jailed. Detention of critics aside, the real turning point for the image of the Kenyatta years came when the culture of political assassinations crept onto the nation's way of life so early, then several times after, during his rule. Pio Gama Pinto, a member of Parliament of Asian Extraction, was assassinated in 1965 hardly two years after independence. Then came the elimination of Kenyatta's presumed trusted lieutenant, Thomas Joseph Odhiambo Mboya, or simply Tom Mboya. Mboya was gunned down in broad daylight on Nairobi's Moi Avenue as he walked out of a chemist. Mboya's convicted killer, Nahashon Isaac Njenga Njoroge, famously asked, why don't you go for the big man? To this day, the jury is still out on who the big man in reference was. How can you interpret the big man? Because there are so many big of them, big men, and you might go the, up the staircase and somebody say, no, there's a bigger man there. And everybody will be saying that same. There was no way of stopping Tom from ever becoming the president of this country. And the only way to stop him, instead of thanking him, they gave him three bullets in his chest at lunchtime to get rid of him. Boya was not afraid of Kenyatta. He was not afraid of Kenyatta. He was very loyal to Kenyatta. He was working for Kenyatta. And at no time in, in, in my view did Boya try to undermine Kenyatta. He may have had his uh, ambition, like all of us, but Tom was very, very loyal to Kenyatta. When uh, Tom was uh, 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 assassinated, Mze definitely, I can tell you, he was very upset. He was very upset. And uh, the, you know, these are some of the things he never really uh, wanted to see in this country. They had a, a philosophy that if you disagree with me, let us argue it out. He used to use a phrase, wanaume ni kuonana. I remember that phrase. Mboya's assassination immediately poisoned ethnic relations between the Luo tribe and President Kenyatta's Kikuyu community. Resentment among the Luos ended in street battles with the police as frustration mounted over the killing of one of Kenya's most gifted political leaders. And it was only a matter of time before the assassination rattled one of Kenya's most stabilizing political friendships, that of Jomo Kenyatta and Jaramogi Oginga Odinga. Three months after the assassination of Tom Boya, a visit to Kisumu by President Kenyatta ended in violence, death, and an ugly verbal exchange between Kenyatta and Oginga. Uh, 
I only saw him upset one time when we had that incident in Kisumu. He expressed his unhappiness in a very strong language in Kisumu, where the incident took place. After that, Mzee never talked about it again. No. No. He had a very uh, soft heart for, for, for Jaramogi. Not at the expenses of Boya, but he, they were like his children. Up to the time Mzee passed on, I never heard him say anything adverse about Jaramogi. Seeing them with um, Ogiondinga, and the way they were interacting, it was very, very powerful, you know, uh, for me. Um, so I was very, actually very sad when they fell out, you know, uh, years later. The Kisumo incident in 1969 virtually ended the Kenyatta-Odinga warm relations. Kenyatta never stepped in the Lakeside city again until his death, while Jaramogi was systematically consigned to the political wilderness. But political assassinations were not to take a long break. Josiah Mwangi Karioki, or J.M. Karioki as he was famously known, was murdered in 1975 under circumstances that heavily rendered suspect operatives within the Kenyatta administration. The problem, problem between Kenyatta and J.M. was a problem of people who wanted leadership. And they thought James is growing too fast. He became too popular. He's, and then, before then, he was too close to Kenyatta. And somebody had to make sure that he separates James from Kenyatta. And indeed he was. There was even a, a song, uh, Maheni Maru. That was actually an interpretation that here is water which we were drinking that is uh, supporting our government and it has become bitter i would tell him say this is what has, uh, uh, has uh, been formulated as a song in the central province and so on and it was uh, a serious problem very serious to say jm wanted to to overthrow Kenyatta, J.M. wanted to take over from Kenyatta, J.M. wanted, there was no such a scheme. And if anybody knows it, then he's keeping it too secret for no apparent reason. Zay was very, very upset about this thing. Uh, and even his responses to my briefing you could see that uh, Mze is very upset as to why this could have been done. Jem was treated as Mze's son. He would get to Katundu without uh, security checking. He would get to State House without security checking. But just in the same way he reacted during Tom Boyer's assassination, Kenyatta decided to tough things out, taking it a level higher by calmly inspecting an impromptu military parade and guard of honor mounted along present day Moi Avenue in city center Nairobi. I think on the advice uh, of the national security, they organized a guard of honor simply to demonstrate that the government is still in charge. That was all. Kenyatta would not be shaken by anything. He was himself. It didn't matter what happened. The, the, the life must, would, would have to go on. And he took decisions. And when he took decisions, uh, he, had, he had a saying, he could not reverse himself. If he make a mistake, he had to live with it. His legendary firmness was perhaps best illustrated by the almost expressionless face he occasionally wore alongside that deep and fierce gaze at sights beyond the horizon. 
But there were other unspoken yet visible symbols of Kenyatta's political power. The bakora, or walking stick, that as legend has it often came in handy, and the heavy leather jackets that clearly constituted his favorite wardrobe. Kenyatta's bakora was like a handkerchief. How do you go without a handkerchief, even if you have no fever? You need it for rubbing sweat or something else. And this Bukora, uh, people misconceived the purpose of it being with Kenyatta all along. I have no information from uh, any direct quarter uh, that Mzee at one time actually alikimbisha mutu or alirezi kimbo apike mutu. But behind the mask of Kenyatta's political toughness was a fun-loving free spirit with an insatiable appetite for traditional dances. It was another way of relaxing him. You know, as a head of state, you have so many things coming to you. And you have so many people uh, coming to see you. Then there is what is perhaps the little known side of Jomo Kenyatta. That is, a Jomo Kenyatta full of fear. Fear for aeroplanes and fear for lifts. Kenyatta did not like flying, you know, out of the, out of the country. If he went out of the country, it was either by ship or on the road. Kenyatta also did not like going by lift. This is why you find even today in uh, Harambe House, his office was in the second floor, so he could walk. We flew the same plane with Jomo Kenyatta, the president. He said to me, I was almost his errand boy, and the moment turbulence, Kenyatta freezes to death. Again, another turbulence, the man just goes gone completely. 